surgery, minimizing pressure in the eye is so important. Uh, keeping the relationship of tissue planes stable, I think is important. I was never happy about techniques that make you remove the nucleus from its space. Uh, I think when everything remains in its normal place, the eyes are quieter and happier. We want to coat delicate tissues, and we have the advantage of the Arshinov soft shell that we can use dispersive OBD and work within cohesive, which is my preference, though certainly there are many ways to skin that cat. Uh, keeping your hands light and not pushing the globe for resonance. If you're always seeing that you're constantly having to move your microscope XY, you're never in the center in your video. Uh, that means that you're influencing the tissue. And if you're doing that, the tissue can't influence and talk to you. So you want to be a little bit lighter with your hands. You want to uh, anticipate uh, and avoid discomfort for the patient. And we have a nice nurse anesthetist I saw yesterday sitting by uh, who rarely is needed, but uh, uh, sometimes vocal local is the most important part. And I can talk for an hour about the psychological words that I've used uh, given my uh, background uh, and my, my history uh, for those patients. And I have the same patter every time uh, throughout the surgery, which tells all the scrub nurses you know, where I'm at. Uh, and, and, and when you, especially if you're going room to room, it, it really helps. Uh, we want to maintain visualization. Of course, we'll use triescence uh, in a vitrectomy situation appropriately, or we'll use tripan when we don't have a good view. And it's, it's such an important part. You know, uh, one of the advantages that, uh, a disadvantage actually that you young people have is that you can accommodate. So you don't really know where you are in the anterior chamber. As you get older, you know, you know you, you've got to focus more to be in focus because you're not accommodating. And it's always helpful to be in focus at the place that you need to be working. Um, you want to keep large fragments far from the endothelium, and this is particularly true of the brunescent lens. And uh, for the brunescent lens, I developed a technique where I leave the uh, nucleified, dense, leathery epinucleus in place till the very end to protect the posterior capsule and keep the zonules expanded. So this is the kind of cataract we're talking about. I practiced in Iowa and Illinois, and we saw plenty of these. And once you get good at something, everybody sends it to you. So watch out what you get good at. Uh, of course, uh, there have been some ways uh, to deal with that that are a little more uh, old or newfangled. And uh, it's not unreasonable in your learning curve for brunescent lenses or even for any densely brunescent lens to go ahead and make a, an M6 incision partial uh, so that you can always opt to that. Uh, uh, afterwards, but that does uh, uh, then entail, you know, having that above and extra incisions and so on. I think the MyLoop can be helpful, but it still breaks it up into large portions that need to be removed and can be challenging where you don't have a good view. And femto laser, uh, you need an awful lot of energy to get through one of these lenses and make a big difference. So I came up with something that I call circumferential disassembly. It's very controlled for brunescent lenses. It respects zonules, as you'll see. It's ideal for small pupils because all you need, you're going to always be within the safe zone of the capsulorexis. So I never make a capsulorexis uh, different than about five millimeters, no matter what the density of my lens. Uh, and uh, it's very endothelium friendly, as you'll see. Uh, the capsulorexis can be tailored to the optic, not the nucleus. So the patient walks away with what we hope for, which is to cover the edges of the implant appropriately. And it minimizes phaco energy because as you'll see, we only use ultrasound uh, to gain purchase uh, in order to apply mechanical forces and then to assist aspiration flow as needed. And uh, one thing that... Um, people no longer use very much, and it's a real pity, in my opinion, is a burst mode, which still is on the machines. And I want to explain that to you. Um, when What we're all used to using now is a torsional or ellip ellip ellipsoid uh, type of, of, of uh, pulse, which has a duty cycle. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the linearity uh, is related on your uh, foot pedal is related to how much ultrasound power you're going to use. So you're constantly going all the way through. And of course, you're throwing in a lot of, um, uh, of longitudinal in a brunescent lens. So it doesn't clog because by definition, you're going to be clogging, 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 clogging till you get to a, enough ultrasound power to take, uh, to take the nucleus away, uh, which isn't a problem in a non-brunescent lens in general. Uh, however, uh, also it's wonderful for sculpting because you're making a, a wider sculpt 
Uh, I hope people can see me on the uh, Zoom, uh, do my little hand things, because I'm kind of into that. Um, at any rate, um, uh, you're making a nice wide sculpt, but the last thing you want to do if you're going to chop, and this is a chopping procedure, is to make a wide opening, because your goal is to get in and hold on, and then apply your mechanical forces. Uh, so... Um, uh, for that reason, burst mode uh, is very helpful because you can set it at the panel ultrasound that you need, which may be 70 to 90% in a truly brunescent lens. And then what the linearity controls is the burst interval. So it's like that uh, on your foot pedal. And therefore, from the very first moment, you're not clogging your, your appropriate to your lens power. And you can alter that based on how quickly uh, it moves in, which you can control so easily because you can have one or two bursts and come up on your foot pedal very easily and not travel too far. And if you go nowhere, you know you, know you need to put your ultrasound up. So for disassembly and chop, burst is invaluable in any kind of nucleus. Uh, and then for removal, then the uh, torsional uh, and, and pulse uh, can be extremely helpful, though not necessarily so much so in the truly brunescent lens. Now, uh, it's become sort of the routine that everybody makes a one millimeter paracentesis, but uh, um, uh, Rich, uh, uh, McCool uh, uh, figured out, Richard McCool figured out that 22 cc's a minute of BSS will uh, be lost through a paracentesis when you have your instrument in there that isn't, that is opening the little, uh, the, the, the little internal valve. Uh, and so uh, either we should reduce, uh, certainly if it's going to be a longer procedure, we're going to use, lose more BSS. And even if it's a short procedure, that's where the, that's where the particles go because there's flow out. And I know our newer machines kind of control this a little bit better. They'll, you know, increase the inflow, you know, if you have a lot of outflow, but you'll still go through more BSS. And in a brunescent lens, this becomes uh, particularly a problem. So either a chopper that has a, um, a sleeve, like our, you know, when we make our FACO incision, we expect it to be what fairly watertight with the silicone sleeve, uh, keeping it from leaking all over the place. And we should do that in the paracentesis or make a better paracentesis a little smaller inside and bigger outside so we don't stretch it and we don't lose so much fluid. Uh, a five millimeter or greater pupil is all we need. Um, uh, Tripan uh, is very useful in brunescent lenses. It looks like a red reflex, but it really is a brunescent reflex. And you'll see in these cases and the video that I show how we don't see the red reflex till almost the end. So it can be very helpful uh, to be able to see that capsulorexis uh, edge. Uh, uh, we, we must uh, have a mobile nucleus for my uh, procedure so that we don't stress zonules. And usually this is very easy in a brunescent lens because there could be a little cortical capsular adhesion, but by and large, the fluffy cortex is pretty much gone and it's, it's you know, it's headed towards uh, being hypermature and, uh, and uh, morgagnon anyway. So it's easy to establish that mobility. Uh, I like to really use that off and off soft shell, particularly in this setting. And uh, it's very important to retract the sleeve um, in a very uh, soft lens or a very dense lens, if we want to chop, we, we need to be near the center of that lens in order to get enough purchase. And, and if your sleeve is right up at the tip of your phaco tip, uh, then you're not going to be able, it's going to be the limiting factor to get into the lens. So we like to retract that sleeve, not so far back, of course, that it'll get into the tunnel and shallow your chamber, uh, but enough that we have uh, a kind of a dipstick that we've performed because we know about how thick that lens is. We remove a little superficial, you know, but we know where we are in the lens if we have our sleeve uh, delimiting our, our dipstick and we can't go more than a half uh, the way through. Uh, and then a uh, fixed vacuum and aspiration. Uh, I don't mind vacuum being, uh, being linear, uh, but as linear aspiration to me doesn't make a lot of sense because uh, then it's going to be variable how close you have to get to a piece before it comes. Uh, and, and that's not intuitively easy, whereas vacuum is very easy in a linearity. If I need more vacuum, I know I have to go a little further on my on my foot pedal, but it's very hard to establish what do I need to do for uh, linear aspiration. So I don't think my infinity settings are really significant, except to say uh, that, but I have them here just so you know uh, in the technique. Uh, but uh, the main thing is to, to say that once I uh, finish uh, removing circumferential 
In circumferential disassembly, when I finish removing the denser internal part of the lens, the endonucleus, and I start to fold the epinucleus in uh, and expose the posterior capsule, I will lower my, uh, my flow and my vacuum uh, so that I don't have as much of a risk of, uh, of, uh, of any surge. Now, um, I, uh, CHOP is uh, poorly adopted by many, and it's so much safer and more efficient in my hands, at least, than uh, sculpting because we're not, we're not wasting any energy and, and we're not at risk for suddenly occluding where we don't want to. Uh, and um, there are several different maneuvers that are useful. Most of the reason that people have difficulty learning vertical CHOP, and I'm not a fan of of, of horizontal chopping because we have to go out of the safe zone underneath the, the capsular rexus out to the equator and then come in. And, and I, I, I think that even super experts uh, sometimes will grab zonules or be in the wrong place for that capsular rexus. I wanna stay within the safe zone at all times. So I've always been a vertical chopper. And one of the reasons that people have so much trouble with that is that uh, as you go in, you've got to gain enough purchase and stay in foot position too in order to then dig in with your, uh, with your chopper and lift and separate. So the idea is that the uh, sucked in uh, 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 phaco lifts a little bit while the uh, chopper sort of uh, depresses a little. And if you lose foot position two for even a moment, you've lost your purchase and it isn't gonna work. Not only that, but in a brunescent lens, there's a tendency for it to tilt because there's nothing really holding it. And it's so dense that when you chop it, when you hold on and chop in this direction and try to pull this up, the whole thing will tend to tilt, which is a problem, which is why I mostly use uh, what I call cross action chop, which I don't know has ever been described in the literature exactly. Uh, but what it is, is I go in in the same way that I would otherwise, but I take my chopper on the other side and that allows me to just separate like this, almost like a pre-chopper. And you'll see a lot of uh, cross-action chop happening here, which I'll show you in a moment in video. Uh, the other uh, thing that's very nice to know is the back crack. And that is anytime you have any access to the, to the bag, uh, any crack that goes through and through, posterior plate or in the periphery, anytime there's any way you can get your chopper, not a sharp chopper, mind you, and I don't think you need a sharp, sharp chopper for the most burnescent lens ever, um, but you can take your chopper and put it uh, through that little crack and then bring it upwards to crack it. And that saves your going out to the periphery. You know, as you kind of eat a piece, sometimes you lose the depth of it right up here, and then you're at risk for getting the capsule or even worse, the iris, uh, and, uh, and, and, and not being able to, to get it to fall in. So if you have any crack, you can make it fall in. So let's look at that. So this is my Rosen splitter. It's a cheap instrument. It's blunt at the tip and it has a slightly ax-like shape on the interior part that helps me use it. And here I'm, I'm burrowing in and I'm doing a cross action chop. This is not a brunescent lens. It's just to show you the technique. So I go in and I cross action chop and I get rid of the little piece and here I can do it again and make it an even smaller piece. And you see how very effortless and simple it is. Here's the back crack. So I'm down there and I'm able, what happened was my, I had a, you know, a thicker posterior plate here. And if I just keep going to the periphery, it won't fold in because it was that center that was thick. Uh, so instead I just lift it up and now I'm not at all at risk uh, for being near the capsule. So here's a, a I think you'll agree, a, 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 a reasonably brunescent lens. And most all my videos are sped up here. So for the sake of time, it is, uh, it does take uh, extra time where I'm maybe, a, I was an eight to 12 minute uh, a uh, FACO time, uh, I, I, this will be a 15 to 20 minute FACO time on a super brunescent lens. And you can see the bubble up there in the uh, endothelial, you know, in the uh, endothelial protective layer. And it's kind of a barometer that shows me that uh, my endothelium is really safe. And what I'm doing is not trying at all to make a, a, a chop through the posterior plate. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open the lens kind of like a clamshell in order to get the meat inside. 
there's always an endonuclear plane. Even though we can't hydrodelineate it like we would in a soft lens, uh, uh, there's, that plane exists. And so what I'm doing is I'm opening the lens. If I want to crack all the way through the bottom, I've got to drag those two halves all the way to the edges, and I'm going to stress my zonules and risk breaking my posterior capsule. And there's no need for that. In fact, I don't want that. I want the epi epinucleus, which is thick. And, and you know, it's those interdigitated leathery fibers at the back, the posterior plate that are really the issue with these lenses. Um, I want uh, uh, that to stay intact because it's going to protect my bare posterior capsule, which has virtually no cortex to protect it. And most of the time the zonules are rather loose. Uh, so uh, this keeps it all expanded. You can see I've made my nucleus mobile. I'm, I'm opening it and I wouldn't even, and you see how I'm using the second hand very actively to kind of uh, lice the little uh, attachments at the posterior plate right there. You could see that little maneuver uh, as I'm as I'm using that, you'll see it more, I'm sure, here, right here. Uh, and I'm feeding that in. And so if you would hear this, you'd only hear a ch when I attach and then a ch, -ch, -ch just to help the, uh, uh, the um, just to help the, the uh, aspiration flow uh, take that piece away. So I'm in burst mode all this time, and therefore I'm using very little FACO. So it's a little fatuous. You'll see that I won't even allow the whole uh, uh, piece of epinucleus to come. I'm going to hold that back because I want it to be the shoe tree in my shoe uh, throughout this case. And you can see how unaffected the bubble is uh, on the uh, endothelium and how, how happy uh, my techs couldn't tell the difference between a 2050 cataract and a super burnescent on day one post-op uh, for this reason of protection. Now, as you get better at it, you'll uh, less often need to... Uh, uh, to uh, replace uh, the endothelial shield, but you'll see I'll do that in this case. Certainly, if I had a Fuchs dystrophy or, or uh, an at-risk cornea for any reason, I would do that uh, even if I don't feel I need it. Pretty soon, you'll see that bubble getting a little smaller, and I'm going to decide uh, that uh, I'm going to replace the OVD, which I want you to see. I always go into a, on foot position zero into an OVD-filled uh, uh, situation. And of course, you always have to recognize that you must establish flow uh, absolutely before you ever go into ultrasound when there's OVD in your environment to prevent a, a burn. Uh, so you can see now we're, uh, we're being pretty uniform. And the whole trick is to just be patient and to, uh, to, to just uniformly thin this lens. And then once that happens, and uh, you'll see some more sped up things and how reproducible this is, uh, you're just barely sort of seeing red reflex at this point, you know? And, and see, I'm not letting the whole thing come because I don't wanna leave some really dense areas that may need to be then removed in the anterior chamber because keep in mind, all of my ultrasound is happening at the iris plane or below at this point. So here I'm, I'm just deciding I'm gonna put in OBD and I'm filling it into itself and put position zero, and then I'm gonna come back. And now I absolutely must establish flow uh, before I go into ultrasound again in order to prevent a wound burn. Uh, but now I know I have you know, full, wonderful protection for that endothelium. Uh, it's rare that I have to re-add uh, uh, on an average uh, brunescent case, uh, but it's uh, never a bad thing. And so now you're starting to see that we're getting to where you see how dense that center is. And this is why when you see people chop, you see them like separate those halves like to, to Timbuktu. And, uh, and instead, now we're just starting to be able to take care of that endonuclear uh, piece here. Uh, still, I mean, that epinuclear piece. Um, now, uh, you don't see the overlay in this one. You will in some of the other videos where you'll see that it's about now or so that I uh, reduce my uh, vacuum and uh, aspiration flow in order to prevent um, uh, clogging. And of course, uh, in order to prevent a surge and uh, the posterior capsule coming up. We have three choices for the last little pieces. You know, We can put more OVD underneath to blow the capsule backwards. I don't like that much because it comes out in little pieces and you never know when it might bring the capsule with it. Uh, or we can take our chopper out so that it won't leak, but by now maybe it could leak slightly or we just protect the capsule. So you'll hear, and then before I go, ch -ch -ch, I'll have the, the uh, secondhand instrument underneath. Uh, now, uh, 
I always like to uh, put BSS in the chamber, kind of like a, uh, uh, a chamber maintainer when I remove anything so the chamber never collapses. And you'll see at the end of the case, everything is clear and lovely. And that's a very typical case in my hands. Here are a number of uh, uh, really uh, more challenging cases. This is a black cataract because it was a retinal detachment from 10, 15 years ago. They told them just to leave well enough alone and never touch that eye. Uh, but the other eye developed enough of the cataract and had a retinal tear that I treated. So we decided to do this eye. And it needed a Malugan ring. It had a very floppy translucent iris because of the ischemia that it ha had had. Uh, and, uh, and you can see we're doing the very same uh, basic maneuvers. Uh, it had very low cell count as well, and it did take him about a week to recover to his best 2030 macula. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and you can see it's very dense. Same thing. We're burrowing in, and then we're trying a, a cross action chop. You see how I'm on the other side of the chopper, and everything is planar. I'm not allowing anything to tilt. And I'm, I'm just slowly getting this open. This is three times, you know, uh, uh, the thing. So, uh, you know, it's a 20, 25 minute case. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, what the patient takes away is the important part. Somebody always needs to watch that you don't run out of BSS. You'll see there's not a lot of flow coming out of my paracentesis because I make it with a triamond blade uh, that's diamond and uh, very 0.3 at the tip and then gets uh, wider to 0.7. So I, I could make a small uh, interior and exterior. And you can see that things are coming along just fine. Uh, and I'm, I'm using that secondhand instrument, that um, Rosen splitter, which goes in through the tiny opening easily and isn't sharp. And I'm using the hatchet-like inside part of that to sometimes sweep away the attachments of the leathery fibers. So hopefully you're not getting bored because I know it's a lot of repetition, but that's kind of the point uh, that this is so reproducible that we can pretty well count on it for every case. I did not have to uh, convert to an extra cap uh, uh, in, dec in a decade. Um, and uh, as you can see, these are not trivial uh, lenses. I did have one that was truly black and really challenged me and I was close to having to <laughs> do something about it, but it, it, gave, it gave in. And it's a matter of uh, kind of a labor of love of patience, as you see here. So now, if you'll watch the aspiration and flow, you can see the rise. I don't like uh, to use a, a, a rise time. Um, and uh, you'll see at some point very soon, I'll be lowering that aspiration and flow rate. As you see, now we're seeing red reflex. Uh, and we're getting last little particles, which as you see, weren't really headed for my paracentesis like they would be if I had a one millimeter opening uh, that was not uh, occluded. Uh, and, um, and so we're just making every effort, you know, to stay in, in the iris plane. And uh, there now, uh, I think I'm about to reduce that aspiration in vacuum to 35 and 300, I think. From 40 to 400. So there we go. Am I not doing it yet? I guess I still feel I have protection. Uh, so we'll we'll flip that out now. Oh, I'm going to add a little more OBD before I flip it because I think he had an 800 cell count. Establish that flow, and now you hear your eh, and I encourage you, as Dr. Mamelis does, to work with your foot pedal and your sounds, because it's all eye, ear, hand, foot coordination, which nothing, not much else in life is like that, um, and protecting the capsule, as you see, and you see we have our aspiration and flow down to 32 and 320. And then it never looks like there's cortex, but these, hyper, these very mature lenses always have cortex. It's just not in the center. So we really need to go hunting for it with a little vacuum setting uh, and always trying to get from the anterior edge so we don't leave little fibers behind. Uh, here I'm enlarging the capsular axis because it was such a, a marbly kind of a cataract that I had made it rather small. And uh, most of the time I'll enlarge after I have the lens in, but I thought it was even small for that, I guess. Um, in this case, and we get that all centered and nice. And, um, and then uh, I always like to remove the OBD from the posterior chamber and then take out the, uh, the ring and then remove from the anterior chamber. 
uh, the OVD, and uh, you can see it was a translumination type iris. Now, uh, that was certainly a very difficult case, but you'll see it's so reproducible in here. I've really sped it up to help you out. And then I'll show you a case, and then I'm going to show you uh, uh, another, another case. And so another issue after this. So uh, I'm going to, uh, I think this is the last one. Um, in the interest of time, first of all, take any questions while this is going on. I've been, yes. On panel mode there? Yes. Hmm. Oh, thanks. It seems like all your settings are on panel mode on the overlay. Um, I find that I have better control if I keep something on linear. Um, and I usually mm -hmm. keep my vacuum on linear mm -hmm. and keep aspiration on panel. And that makes lots of sense. As I told you earlier, I think vacuum, linear vacuum makes some sense. But all I want to think about in the burnescent lens is, uh, is my burst interval. <laughs> and, and there's no need to vary the vacuum for that. I vary the vacuum a lot for uh, INA. Uh, but I, I do see your point. Uh, as I made the point, I really don't like aspiration. Uh, to be that way, uh, aspiration flow. Uh, but you make a good point, and there's nothing wrong with linear vacuum. Uh, aspiration, you just can't intuit what's going to happen. It either happens faster or slower, or you get this close to the piece, and it works right now, but then you change your aspiration flow rate and have to get that close to the piece for it to come. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I'm not a fan. Uh, let's see if we'll skip a little further along. I don't know if I have a ability to do that. Um, I wanted you to see the, uh, no, I guess I don't. Um, I wanted you to see the colobomidus eye because it shows also how very, oh, did you already see it? I took my eye off. Okay, so we'll just go to the next. Thank you. Uh, it's so zonial friendly that we don't need to hold the zonules in that colobomidus eye, and it was a very shallow eye, and still the cornea did well. So uh, establishing flow before engaging phaco, removing superficial cortex for a view, bury the tip uh, into the nucleus, maintaining vacuum at depth, uh, and uh, then place the second instrument and dig in, allow time for propagation. You know, the, the concept that this is a chop, it's not really a chop. We're, we're actually needing to propagate a fault line. And that happens really fast in your nice two plus Goldilocks lens, but it doesn't happen fast in, in a brunescent lens. And so you will have to allow that fault line to happen. And uh, we just repeat that and uh, then reduce the vacuum in AFR, uh, protecting the capsule from surge with the secondhand instrument. So uh, I'm going to add a new wrinkle to things in this case. And I wonder, uh, we have a nonverbal 65-year-old intellectually limited white male um, who stopped participating in any activities, can't find his food, uh, and they finally bring him in to see us. And we can get close enough for retinoscopy and maybe a little kind of a slight indirect, but not really. And he's got black cataracts and just the glimpse of the fundus shows us that in fact, the view is consistent with his function. He's uh, got close enough uh, sweet talking to do a little finger tension, you know, a uh, uh, ballotment, you know, of the globe. So he's not extreme in his pressure in one direction or another. So what would be our plan? Um, so the surgical plan is needless to say, you know, exam under anesthesia. Uh, and we make measurements right away. And we talk at length to the family because if this man didn't get brought in for his cataract until he couldn't find his food, do you think he'll ever be brought in for his YAG capsulotomy? Uh, I rather doubt it. Um, and, um, and so, and no way he's gonna sit for a YAG. So that would have to be a general anesthetic for the YAG as well. And so uh, after a long conversation with family, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, I see somebody looking. Um, after a long uh, conversation, we decided not only uh, to do his Burnett's and cataracts, but uh, to do a sequential same day uh, uh, surgery, as well as posterior optic capture with a planned posterior capsulorexis for both eyes. Assuming all goes well with the first eye, we were going to do the same with the second. Uh, all the dictates of the International Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgery uh, was, you know, was uh, followed. And most particularly, I used uh, intracameral moxifloxacin, Vigamox, actually uh, from 2006, I think, is when Arshinoff described it and had a thousand cases ahead of me. Uh, and for every case, so I certainly would for any complicated case, and it's necessary, I believe, if you're going to consider a same-day sequential. So uh, I'll show this to you. I've left some sound here. Uh, 
from the second eye. This is the less bad left eye. We do the right eye first. It wasn't simultaneous like this. It was sequential, of course. <laughs> um, and, and, <laughs> right. And, uh, and so you can see again how, uh, how little fake I'm applying by hearing the sound. Hopefully you can hear this here and there. And so I, I think I've never gone above 40 seconds with people seeing the blackest lens. Uh, and um, we can see that we're going to uh, go ahead and make our way through this lens in the same way that I just described. Uh, yeah, the left is a little bit less dense, so you'll see that I'll finish ahead in the left eye compared to the right eye. It's so reproducible that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, just uh, chop in general, I always go down all of my uh, CD speed or whatever machine I was using, my paper times in order to be able to get better and better at things. The more uniform I got, you know, you, get, you understand the locks to uh, nuclear sclerosis, and if you're a three plus nuclear sclerosis, I knew that I was going to be, you know, a, a five, you know, or six seconds of, of, uh, of uh, CBD. And as you see that getting more and more consistent, you know that you are more and more consistent in the ability of cataracts. So, um, General anesthesia made this uh, kind of easy because I, I didn't have to worry. I usually had the uh, family watching through the microscope in a remote room. Uh, so I talked to the family and tell them what's going on. And I talked to the, uh, I actually uh, used that as an excuse to talk to the patient and tell them what's going on and very relaxing to the people matter. Um, any questions while I'm sort of getting to the point here of uh, the posterior rexus? If not, let me just talk a little bit about that. So uh, one of my um, real areas of interest is optic capture, and particularly primary posterior capsulorexis, that's hyloid sparing. And uh, I believe the hyloid is really the two-chambered causes the two-chambered eye, and we know so little about the retinal uh, sadly, which uh, we'll talk about. Uh, well, I have a whole you know, two hours to discuss that. Uh, thanks to Marie Jose Tassignon, some of the work that was done in the 1800s on the anatomy of the retroventricular space is now becoming uh, known. Uh, our uh, imaging of that area doesn't work very well. We're starting to talk about a subspecialty of middle segment surgery, and that affects a lot of things. So now that I've finished uh, with the last, and you'll see I'm protecting the capsule and getting any last little fragments. And uh, what you'll see in a moment is that I'll get ready to do my posterior rexus. And uh, what that entails is putting some OVD into the uh, sulcus in order to flatten the anterior and posterior capsules together. Uh, and uh, once, we, uh, once we have a nice flat plane, uh, then we uh, go in with a, a, a 30 gauge needle, as you see here, ski up the posterior capsule, which as you know is 4 microns thick compared to 14 microns of the uh, anterior capsule, and make a little opening. And it's because we don't know where the anterior hyloid is. It could be right behind it, uh, or it could be a real, uh, a real space versus a potential space. Now I'm placing cohesive OBD uh, through that tear in the opening of the posterior capsule, and it's kind of pretty much filling into itself. I felt that I had enough done there. And I'm, I'll am i only do a posterior, primary posterior capsulorexis if I have an anterior capsulorexis that is capturable, because then I can always put a sulcus lens and anterior capture or reverse optic capture. I have many opportunities to keep this from being a difficult case. And now I'm just uh, using more of a centripetal force uh, and uh, because okay. it's more elastic. I'm yeah, following capture. the, uh, okay. uh, the uh, capsule. Um, the anterior capsulotomy. And I made it a little small. I decided I'm just gonna gild the lily a bit and make a little opening in that capsule again, make a little tangential cut and make it more perfect. And you can see it's so controllable that one can do that even for that posterior capsule. And now I put OVD into the sulcus of the bag. So I've opened a big landing spot for my three piece lens and the anterior haptic, the leading haptic uh, goes into the bag. Uh, I never want to put it under the posterior capsulorexis into burger space, of course, uh, and, and we rotate that into position, and then we're able to optic capture. Uh, it doesn't always just pop into place like it does for an anterior capture. Sometimes we have to walk it from uh, haptic-optic junction to haptic-optic junction, and we get that nice football shape. 
And uh, so uh, you can see here, this is on the table immediately after that picture on the right isn't so lovely, but it's foggy all over, as you can see. Um, anytime, uh, and in this case, I used Triessence uh, and Moxie because we didn't know if we'd get any drops into the guy, but he became tremendously uh, um, able to do many things afterwards and cooperate afterwards, whereas before he was truly blind. So here are some resources for you I've included. Uh, and I'd like to talk about another uh, completely different case since we have extra time and I thought enough was enough with the uh, brunescent lens. Uh, would anybody like to have any questions about the brunescent technique? I, I've had difficulty, I really described this in 2005 <laughs> on uh, Osher's video journal and, um, and I've written in textbooks and I've actually uh, lectured to whole departments and I'm not sure if anybody's really adopting this. And I don't know why, because I watch these, these um, my loop cases and, you know, these giant four pieces, you know, are just floating around and up near the endothelium. And that's if, you know, they don't get it stuck somewhere. Uh, and, um, and certainly I think femto is, you know, not the revolution it was meant to be. Uh, and uh, so flax is really not the answer. Uh, I think many people, I hope that, extra cap has become a thing of the past and that M6 is now uh, taught, but there's so many residencies where it isn't, which is really a pity uh, because that's certainly a viable option. Uh, how do people feel about this? And uh, is it something that you would, what would be the barrier to taking this on? I think Jeff's gonna say something here in a moment. He's getting the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just an MA, MA60. No, Lisa, beautiful surgery. It, it, it's really lovely to see. And yeah, I, th I think adoption, adoption of techniques is a really interesting conversation. You know, why things kind of, some take off, some don't, you know, uh, for so long, you know, it was, you know, Alan and Randy and, and Nick as our primary surgeons. So you, you kind of had this, you know, uh, almost like a family tree of surgeons underneath them that certainly operate with certain techniques, you know, pre-chopping certainly one that, that's carried forward. You know, I, I really, really like the technique. I think it's really thoughtful, uh, very meticulous. Um, sometimes I think we, we just might be in a hurry and want to see those big quadrants that you can get with a, a my loop. Uh, a specific question about the technique is, and I can hear Nick Mamelis talking about the leathery plate uh, behind. And in a scenario where you're dividing and you're left with that just, just kind of dense shell, uh, just kind of tips thoughts about uh, how to manage that shell. Cause that, that, that's a tricky one. That's a good question. Um, by the time you get that endonucleus debulked, you've pretty well gotten rid of most of that leathery thing. So sometimes it'll fall apart for you. You can just, you can just actually, you know, it'll be, you can just split that epinucleus and take it piece by piece uh, or else it will just roll in. And when it rolls in, then it's fairly easy to take care of because now you've got all this space, you know, that you're working with. So uh, if you if you look at uh, participation of different techniques and approaches, and we've done a couple of those surveys and published, you know, Jeff's probably time to do that again, see how that's evolved, is uh, what, what I see you doing is uh, something that is, is clearly, you know, a focus on uh, mechanical disassembly and always trying to have uh, small controlled bite-sized pieces uh, and then use your second instrument to help mechanically to hold it in place so that you minimize the amount of ultrasound. I think that's, there's real good evidence and there's good studies, you know, that we've done as well that show that that minimizes endothelial damage. And if you use short little bursts of ultrasound energy that from the work we've done in regards to wound burns, it's impossible to get a wound burn. You, you really need a relatively long run of uh, a lot of ultrasound to get enough uh, heat to cause a burn, with the single exception, if you do it inside of an eye full of Helon 5, you can get a burn in about three seconds. We've seen that on videos. We know that's documented. We've seen that happen under, uh, you know, experimental conditions. So, um, you know, uh, David Chang and I taught a, a, a CHOP course uh, with Skip Nickerman for years and years and years. Uh, 
And uh, uh, I think that shop course is it's still going. Is, I think is it David is. I think still Dave's got a shop? Still doing course it. Still yes, going? I think he is. Yes. You know, I yes. finally signed up. But nobody does cross blood. action shop, right? You've never seen that. Cross uh, action, there's have you? that is one is variation that? that was part of that course that Good. we chatted about and uh, talked about. You know, that as a possible variation moving forward. Uh, talked about uh, you know a lot of the different features you have. So if you look at participation. Uh, overall in mechanical disassembly. So let's just take that. This is a variation in mechanical disassembly. And, uh, um, you know, the classical grooving technique and then splitting into four quadrants has been the majority, but it's been less and less and less as time's gone on. And then uh, chopping uh, has picked up uh, more and more. And the last time we looked at it, uh, vertical chop was about, and oh my gosh, this has now been 10 years. <laughs> so, and I don't think we've had a, no good paper has been published since that in regards to where techniques are across the country. But at that time, um, you know, vertical chopping was about 22, 23%. Horizontal uh, chopping had dropped off some. And for, I think for the reasons you say, I, I've used both. I think they both can be very effective, but you do have to be really careful that you don't get on top of the anterior capsule or you'll just rip the zonules, obviously. Uh, and that was about 18%, but uh, different variations, either uh, you know, stop and chop, which was still uses a lot of mechanical energy or the regular, it was still represented about you know 60% of those that were done. And so I think so much of it has to do with what's being taught. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the people here, have had enough of different variations of chopping. I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'd, I'd be surprised if anybody's carrying on their technique after leaving here without some element of chopping. Interesting. The, the one thing that uh, uh, a less experienced surgeons run into, and this is coming from the course, when uh, you have these black cataracts, by not trying to get that early split through that posterior leather, leather plate, is that uh, due to timidity, and, and as I watch as you did it, I mean, you were making sure that you were getting the core elements of that leather plate as you went around. If you keep being too anterior, and then all of a sudden you leave yourself with everything removed but a leathery plate, and it's still pretty darn stiff, and then how you get it. And, uh, uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of people in the course that go on that that's when they break the capsule. They're trying to get this. That's nothing's left as a leathery plate down there, and so uh, that's sometimes that's comparential disassembly is so nice because the leathery fibers come with them. So, but, I'm, but you've got to make sure you're getting at it. And I watch you, and you're getting at it. And if you're not, so that's part of the reason I must admit, of course, we emphasize it. It makes sense earlier rather than later that you're starting to split through that leathery plate, and so that you you don't you aren't left with this large flat hard area that will is not malleable mm -hmm. and stuck there on the plate. Makes sense. And again, another one that, that I saw that, uh, uh, you know, I've certainly always recommended in all the courses I was involved in is that when you're getting towards the end, is that make sure before you use ultrasound that, uh, uh, you know, that you, you have your chopper in a safe position, always just under the tip. So if the capsule comes up, right. it's going against the chopper and right. not against your tip because it's the combination of aspiration, a little post occlusion surge, contact in your capsule. That's when absolutely, it breaks. absolutely. And it's easy also when you have the sleeve back like that, which is necessary for the really dense lens. Uh, it's easy to withdraw into the tunnel and let things collapse. That you have to really be down. mindful not to do that. That's another place where I've, you know, once in a while uh, had an issue. Uh, so uh, can we talk about this next? Oh, you, another question? Yes or no? Okay. Uh, so. I have a, uh, uh, this is a case that I'm very proud of. Uh, it was a very challenging case. Uh, an 11 year old boy presented uh, with near total hyphema uh, after a BB gun hit theoretically his closed lid of his right eye. He had hand motion vision with good projection uh, and an IOP of 30. There was no reverse afferent pupillary defect, which you know when you don't have a pupil on one side and you do on the other, you need log unit. Uh, uh, neutral density filters in order to equal it out, in order to look at the only the pupil that moves in order to see if there's an afferent defect. I was a uh, disciple of uh, Stan Thompson, so I'm, uh, that's a big, uh, he was Mr. Pupil, you know, I, I'm sure you'd remember, uh, and uh, at University of Iowa. 
Um, and uh, he, uh, he ma we managed him conservatively. Uh, whenever it's possible to control inflammation in a trauma uh, where the lens is involved and to control pressure, it's a good idea to wait for the eye to be less hot, to wait for fibrosis, which makes the, uh, any break in the capsule more, uh, less likely to tear. And the eye did quiet and uh, we were able to wait two months before surgery. Now, all the risks were discussed with the parents. It was a uh, uh, possibility of retinal detachment and corneal edema, infection, permanent glaucoma. They were very aware that they had to be followed for life for glaucoma, regardless for traumatic glaucoma. There could be glare and irregular pupil. They were prepared to be aphakic and need another surgery based on that. Uh, but we did calculate the lens based on the fellow eye. Uh, there was a potential need for more than one surgery and, of course, the general anesthetic risks. This is what the eye looked like uh, when it quieted down. You can see there's 180-degree ortodialysis, anterior capsule rupture. B-scan was normal of the posterior segment. Um, probable zonulolysis, unknown posterior capsule status, anterior and posterior synechia. And so I'm going to show you our first surgery. Does anyone want to talk? I, I want to get through it. So uh, does anyone want to talk, though, about how they would handle the case or anything specific? There's a, a much more interesting inflection point a little bit later. So perhaps we'll move. Yeah. What's that? Delicately. Delicately. Yes, that's a good idea. Uh, so uh, perhaps, uh, let's see, why is this not going? There we go. So uh, my goal is usually not to create any turbulence at all. And so I'm going to do everything manually. And, you know, you're, you're seeing that I'm, I'm taking advantage of manual quite a bit. Uh, I make sure that his pressure is okay before I enter. I put in tree essence and didn't see any vitreous forward. I put in tripan blue because I'm looking for where the heck is that capsule? Um, you know, what's happening with the anterior capsule. And I'm doing everything with just, uh, just a syringe and the eye is full of OVD so that I keep it normotensive throughout the case. I have to replace it, you know, and this is not the time to, you know, to, to be measuring how much OVD you're going to use. And now I need to establish the appropriate planes. So preferably by uh, uh, by blunt dissection, but sometimes by sharp dissection, it's necessary to break these synechia, these uh, 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 posterior synechia, uh, and uh, to establish uh, a free iris again. And so a little bit of sharp dissection, trying to spare the iris rim as best I can. And uh, with more tripan, uh, so I'm just starting to, uh, to be able to visualize the, the visual axis here. And uh, with more, uh, more help from plenty of OBD and uh, a little more tripan here and there, which I like on an Osher cannula, which is just a cannula with the hole at the bottom instead of at the tip that allows you to paint tripan very accurately where you need to uh, under OBD. And uh, so now I'm just, I'm removing the flocculent uh, uh, lens material. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a long case. If I want to make it a short case, then I'm going to use uh, uh, the equipment, you know, INA and, and, and uh, but uh, but I'd rather keep everything in its place since I just don't know where anything is. Um, and so uh, now I can see that I have some anterior capsule above uh, and uh, I'm breaking the posterior synechia of that upper area of the iris. Uh, and I don't know what's going on below really. I don't see any hole in the, in the posterior capsule as yet. Uh, this is highly edited, of course, uh, so I may have used some tree essence in between, I'm not sure, but of course we're filled with OVD, so it's not all that helpful uh, at that point. It can block your particulate identification of vitreous. Um, that's why I put the tree essence in first before the OVD. Uh, and, um, and so I'm trying to, uh, to establish my planes and remove any flocculent lens material that I possibly can. And uh, that's a little subconj epi lidocaine epi, even though it's general anesthesia, just to try to get some hemostasis, which you'll see didn't work too well. <laughs> um, I'm doing goniosynechiolysis now. I decided not to put a gonio lens on, uh, just I need my view more than anything else. So uh, I didn't think I would do anything different than what I'm doing anyway, even if I viewed it. But the goal is to try to open that angle because it still might be functional. Uh, uh, now I'm going to use a double arm tenno. Uh, in order to two double arm tenos is what I'm trying to decide now in order to deal with the iridodialysis. Uh, and uh, these lovely little uh, uh, forceps from MST are just so fantastic. Uh, I, I hear I've got a straight needle. I always have the uh, scrub nurse. I have no financial interest in any of it, by the way. I always have the scrub nurse 
uh, follow my needle tip because it's a very deep uh, orbit, orbit, orbit in this little boy. And look, I go through the drape. And when you do that, you need to get the needle off the tray. Uh, and uh, so I have somebody else watch. You know, you're too busy uh, to watch everything. And so I'll watch if I've, uh, I've invaded my, um, uh, my uh, uh, drape and that needle is contaminated. Uh, and uh, cut it and uh, get rid of that. So here I'm, uh, of course, when you do an aerodialysis, you don't want to make it tight. Uh, 10 is fine. Uh, I do have a paper with Boris Malyugin where we showed uh, that even the 9 -O can, uh, going through a, um, uh, uh, a, an eyelet will get cheese wired. And that's really not so much the dissolution of the land, of the, uh, of the material of the, of the, uh, material, but more that it cheese wires through an eyelet. So you don't need a 9 if you're going to be having no eyelet and sewing iris, just 10 is fine. I decide that I have enough anterior capsule that I'm going to put a three-piece lens. I didn't think a one-piece lens would be okay because I couldn't see any capsule for over 180 degrees. So I wouldn't allow the uh, one-piece haptic to be in the sulcus or near the iris. And I decided though that I had enough coverage uh, to place the uh, three-piece IOL, which I did. And I looked everywhere for any possibility of, um, uh, of, of any vitreous and didn't see any. Uh, and uh, there's my last triescence, dilute triescence. And at three months post-op, uh, he, uh, he was 2060. So we waited three months to do the YAG laser because, uh, and there was this interesting uh, hole here in the anterior capsule. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the rest of the anterior capsule. Uh, and so uh, we waited and we did the AG and, um, and uh, then he was 2025, 20, uh, uncorrected actually amazingly enough and uh, with a, a, a quiet eye and off drops. And this is what he looked like same day post-op. Uh, and uh, then, um, we, uh, we quieted the eye. We used a fair amount of anti-inflammatory uh, topically. I left some triessence in the eye at the end of the case uh, for uh, the first few days. Uh, we followed him closely. Uh, he really, he did, uh, he was 2060 on day one, but he did come around. Um, and uh, we gave him polycarbonate safety glasses, even though he's Plano in the other eye uh, with a progressive ad. And uh, eventually we had to let him go back to uh, a dodgeball. Um, and he returned, uh, having been hit in the eye with iritis. Uh, and, um, and the question was what to do, because uh, look at this, the haptic of the IOL is sticking through the iris, which is why I, didn't, I thought the lens was dislocated uh, and had to be, and I had to go back in. So the plan was uh, to go back in an unsustain unsustainable situation. Uh, and I presume the IOL was unstable. And here's where you'll see that everything is not what we think it is. And I just have a few minutes, uh, I have three minutes, it looks like on my watch. I'm sorry that it's almost over because I'd like you to see the end. Uh, we're going to use a trocar uh, system to uh, do the vitrectomy because my plan was to do, uh, take care uh, of vitrectomy, um, uh, a, a one port pars plane of vitrectomy and a, a posterior capsularexis. Uh, after uh, uh, to enlarge the enlarge the YAG into a with a vitrector rexus into something that was capturable for the optic that was my plan, uh, but you'll see that things don't turn out as expected at all because when I go in there to start doing this it was very hard to get a hold of the uh, the capsule edge and what I started to notice was that that lens was just stable as could be. <laughs> And I, I just didn't see any, uh, here I'm starting to enlarge the YAG, uh, but uh, the thing was is that I was so surprised to see how stable that lens was, and yet the haptic is up here in the iris. Uh, and uh, so um, I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna explore. And what I decided, and I, uh, that was before valves in trocars, so I put a plug in the valve. I always want a closed system. And we're going to explore and what I'm gonna find out is that that lens is just stable as the day is long and beautifully centered. So I don't wanna mess with that. Uh, and uh, now I have a nice opening, but what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna leave that haptic there. So I'm going to untangle the haptic. And um, hopefully I, can, I can't speed this along, unfortunately. I think I'm gonna be about three minutes late. So my, forgive me, uh, we had some good discussion though along the way. I'm gonna untangle this haptic. 
Uh, I'm going to find it here and I'm going to release it from its attachment to the um, to the iris. And that's, you know, our sutured iris there. That's the iris that was uh, had the iridodialysis. And when I get a hold of this thing, what I'm going to find is I'm going to give it a shake. And this thing is just, that lens is so stable. Uh, so I decide the haptic isn't doing any good and it's just causing trouble. And I decide to amputate that haptic. And then to bring the iris taut uh, so that he has, with time, he got more and more of a, a bigger pupil. Uh, and so I'm going to use a seeps or a modified seeps or not, you know, in a, uh, this um, uh, technique um, to uh, make the pupil a little bit uh, more physiologic and taut away from the uh, capsule and the lens. And uh, this uh, shows a very good lesson at the end. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll stick with me for another two minutes. Um, and, and that is that I'm gonna remove the OBD with the vitrector since I already have it out. And my last maneuver is going to be to put in triescence. And uh, you'll see the shocker that happens when I do that because everything looks so stable and so perfect. And that's the first time I saw vitreous present. <laughs> and whether it was there all along, or whether it was that I stirred it up, I don't know, but I didn't take the trocar out until the end. And so I was able to go in and, and uh, call home that prolapsed vitreous out of the way. And uh, ended up with um, a wonderful situation. And then final leave some tree essence and everything is nice and stable. Put a stitch over there. And uh, this uh, was sutureless, you wanna tamp it shut like any scleral tunnel, the floor and the ceiling have to come together and then you need to firm the eye to see, do you have any bleb of any sort? If you did, you would take down that conge and you would suture it, uh, which I didn't need to do. And uh, that was the end of that case. And here, this is two weeks post haptic am amputation. And uh, he was off all meds for four months, uh, after four months and uh, everything went great. I have 10 year follow-up. And, uh, and he requires one drop for glaucoma at the present time. So uh, hopefully he'll be a candidate for uh, some sort of MIG someday <laughs> and, uh, and have a very happy eye uh, that is only missing its uh, presbyopia ability. And maybe we'll have uh, some uh, ability to do a femto uh, index shaping at some point and give him a better uh, near as well as distance. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, uh, just to, to sum up, avoid irrigation and turbulence, identify structures, maintain the chamber, compartmentalize, expose trabecular meshwork, avoid cautery, prepare the patient for more than one surgery. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope this was great. It's my privilege and pleasure to be an adjunct professor here at Utah. And I'm always aghast at the wonderful things that you're doing here. So, so glad to be part of it. Thank you. I'm here for questions if anyone has time and any questions or wants to see any surgeries, I even have my computer along. Mm -hmm.